Welcome back to the show. We have, of course, had fantastic news this afternoon. I am announcing that Cabinet agrees we are ready to move into Level 2, to open up the economy, but to do it as safely as possible. We will be moving to Level 2 from Thursday. Retail, malls, cafes, restaurants, cinemas, playgrounds and other public places can reopen, followed by schools on Monday and bars next week on Thursday. Finance Minister Grant Robertson is with me now. Minister, hello. Good evening, Heather. This is brilliant news for these industries, but 10 does seem a bit arbitrary, so why that number? Sorry, did you say 10? 10, 10 as in the capping of the, yes, the groups yes. at 10. Look, it's all about um, the the risk factors that the Ministry of Health have identified to us. And if you think about the clusters that we've had, they've all been built around things like stag do's, weddings, parties, etc. And so this is really about us staging our return to what we've been calling mass gatherings. Interestingly, it is the same as what the Australian government have foreshadowed as well. And I think it's because all around the world, we're just aware that the way this virus works is in those big gatherings. And what we're talking about there really are, I guess the best word I can come up with is uncontrolled environments. So if you're in a, in a movie theatre, it'll be organised, you'll be in different seats, there'll be gaps between you and the other people. And so we can have 100 people in that space. But when we get into private parties and things like that, it's much harder. So as both the Prime Minister and Dr Bloomfield indicated today, we'll look to move after two weeks from 10 and, and hopefully go to a significantly larger number and, and reach that 100 number as, as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, given that we've already seen a lot of breaches at the weekend um, and and sounds like there were some parties that were bigger than 10, do you expect that people will break this rule? I certainly hope not. And, and this really is the time, Heather, I think, as we move to level two. It, it gets more complex and therefore it does require more personal responsibility, essentially. And I just really want people to have a think about what a fantastic job all New Zealanders have done and that we don't want to go backwards. And so, yep, I'm sure there'll be some people who'll break the rules, but I think the vast majority of New Zealanders will look forward to getting together with their friends. It'll just be in slightly smaller groups than they might have hoped for, but that'll come back soon too. So what should people expect if they are having perhaps a dinner party at home or their family around the group looks like it might be 10 or, you know, even slightly bigger, maybe 11, 12? Should they expect the police to knock on their door, come in and count I people? Wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, the police will be focused on, as they have been under the other levels, where where they need to get on top of things that, you know, might be getting a bit out of control or, or where there is particularly high risk factors. And I think most people organising a dinner party want to be responsible. They want to do the right thing. The one thing that Prime Minister did make clear, which is important, is that if you happen to live in a family group of larger than 10, we aren't asking you to kick the two teenagers out just because you don't want them around. So we are being pragmatic at that level. What was the health advice? The health advice was to do exactly what we've done with one small exception, and that is that um, the, Minister, the Director General of Health wanted bars to be closed for a further two weeks. Uh, we felt that one week was a, was a reasonable balance. That's because, firstly, um, we will have you know a further week's worth of information about how we've done under Level 3 by that point. And secondly, the mitigations we've already put in place for bars, for example, that you have to be seated, that there needs to be that physical distancing, and that you will be served only by one waiter or waitress, that we think mitigates it enough. But we listened to our health officials and said, well, let's give it one more week. Obviously, restaurants are still um, all good to go and essentially anywhere where the purpose is going to eat and you might have a drink while you're eating, that's fine and that can go ahead um, immediately from Thursday. Is our contact uh, tracing gold standard? It's pretty much there now, I think, Heather. You know, we'll always keep trying to find ways of improving it. But as the as the Prime Minister indicated today, you know, we have the ability now to follow up thousands of cases um, quick, or thousands of contacts, sorry, quickly. Um, and, you know, 180 cases a day worth of contacts. You know, we're in a very, very strong position, but we'll continue to develop that. There's also the issue of how technology interacts with contact tracing as well, and we're doing more work on that at the moment too. So, you know, we, we certainly got some important lessons from Dr. Aisha Verrill's report, and we're well advanced. You've ignored the report, though, haven't you? No, definitely not. We're talking about the Cabinet today, Well, actually. she said that you need to be able to trace 1,000 cases a day. You can only trace 185 cases a day. 
Yeah, well, I think I think we're building that up really well, and we've got the capacity there to deal with the situation we're in now, and we'll continue to to build on this our is, capacity. I mean, the only reason that this is important is because if we get a flare up, which it seems is going to happen, Germany, South Korea, Singapore—they've all experienced flare ups. Australia is experiencing one in Victoria at the moment. Can we actually get on top of it if we can only do a hundred? If we can only do eighteen point five percent of what she is recommending. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I am confident because the kind of levels that we have uh, in terms of in terms of infections at the moment, even a small spike, we are able to deal with well, and we continue to grow that capacity every single day. Minister, I want to talk to you about this gag memo that was sent out on Friday. Do you agree with that email from the Prime Minister's office that there is no real need, quote, for your government to, quote, defend because, quote, the public have confidence? I don't think that email was at all well worded, and the Prime Minister said that today. Do you agree with um, the you know, it because you've been No, I don't really. I mean, the, 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 you know, because you've been talking to me every week, and sometimes more than once a week for the last seven weeks, as has the Prime Minister, as have other ministers and the Director General of Health and other senior public servants. So we, we continually been out there answering questions, explaining what we're doing. What we had was a massive uh, lot of documents, and again, as the Prime Minister said today, we'll certainly take on board the feedback about releasing those earlier in the day and, and making sure people know what days they're coming on. But overall, you know, we're getting that information out there. People will see that we were making a lot of huge decisions in real time. Of course, that email could have been worded a lot better, and I'm sure the person who wrote it's aware of that now. It's more that, you know, and I know that you and the Prime Minister have been fronting up, uh, but other ministers have been told not to front up and rather should just dismiss. That's not a good look, is it? Look, I don't believe they have been. I mean, I appreciate that. That's that, what the, the email said. The, I was say, I appreciate the wording of the email might have given you that impression, but that's not the case. It's down to some very, very practical things that I'm available in, here in Wellington and have been doing a lot of the media directly from here. And also it's natural that as the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, we tend to be the people who are across you know, the vast majority of issues. And just like in this interview here, they, you cover a lot of ground. Um, and so we've tended to be asked to go on and, and do this because we can provide the answers. But ministers are answering questions in Parliament. Ministers are, are available and, and I'm sure will be increasingly okay. you know, sought by you. So y- you consider your government to still be transparent? Oh, well, I think we are. And we, OK, we so will you release the Crown advice? Crown law advice. Well, that, that's a slightly different matter to do with legal privilege and um, not one that, um, in my case, as the Minister of Finance, I'm going to go beyond what the Attorney General decides there. Um, the Attorney General has been very, very clear that his view is that the government has acted legally in all steps and all respects of the situation. If legal privilege didn't apply, would you expect him to release the advice? Oh, you know, I mean, again, when it comes to legal advice, I'll defer to the Attorney General in that regard. But as you've seen with the documents that we released on Friday and ones that have come, we're releasing a lot of information about what we're doing. All right, Minister, you are familiar with Section 4.68, Subsection B of the Cabinet Manual? You'll need to just refresh my memory, Heather. Well, allow me to. (laughs) Fair enough. Okay, it says the protection of legal privilege may be lost through implied implied waiver, quote, which occurs when a client voluntarily discloses a significant part of the legal advice in a way that is inconsistent with a claim to its confidentiality. For example, a statement such as, I have received legal advice and acted on it, may constitute a waiver. So have you considered the possibility that David Parker, by referring to the Crown Law advice as extensively and often as he has, may have waived legal privilege? I think the critical word in that sentence, and neither you nor I are lawyers either, is the word may. And so, you know, it is a permissive word. Uh, The Attorney General's job is to uphold, you know, the Crown's legal position in every situation. Um, He's been very clear that as a government we have acted and, you know, in line with the law, we've acted legally. And so, you know, that is the position I rely on, is what he has said. Um, these matters come up from time to time when legal privilege is involved. And, and Mr Parker gave a, an extensive presentation about that um, on Friday, I believe. All right. Uh, yes, and speaking of which, on Friday, he was doing his Facebook Live on his Facebook page. This is the Attorney General, David Parker. He said this. Crown Law's advice is that there was and is no gap in enforcement powers. That's waiving legal legal privilege, isn't it? Oh, I am. T- <laughs> I'm just not going to make advance a legal opinion on that. Either I'm sticking with 
the person who's charged by our cabinet uh, to be um, on top of these matters. Okay. And I stick by what he said. Final question. NZME has filed an urgent com- uh, Commerce Commission application today to purchase stuff for $1. Do you think NZME should be allowed to buy stuff? Again, this is very much a commercially sensitive matter. Um, there are clearly a couple of hoops for NZME which have been in play for some time now in terms of the Commerce Commission and the rules around competition. The Commerce Commission has the ability to deal with those, but I would suggest that it would be a little bit dangerous for me to step into what is ostensibly a commercial situation. I've read comments today publicly from both NZME and staff that may lead me to believe that their position of not commenting is a very sensible one and what is clearly quite a dynamic commercial situation. Minister, something's just been raised with me, which is that the COVID-19 website says that gatherings of 10 people is only allowed to, that's only allowed to go on for two hours. Is that the case? Um, I don't. I'm not sure. That's certainly the case for the restaurant bookings and the and the and you know turning people over yeah. um, within the two hours. But in terms of other kind of gatherings like a party at your house, I don't imagine that's what's um, being talked about there. Um, I you know I'm not familiar with what's gone on the website. But it says on the website discussion. gatherings at home of up to ten people. Time limit two hours. I need to go and check on that, Heather. I know okay. we did have that discussion with respect to um, things like restaurants and so on. I, I, I'll have to go and check about whether or not that's accurate. About whether or not that's accurate.